All right, I'm not terribly sure what motivates me to buy games like this, but I do, and I sometimes get pleasure out of them. This one's Gloria Mundi. I've never played it before. This is going to be as often with uh, the games I've been videoing, something I haven't looked at at all. So, as usual, I'm not going to know the rules very well, but they don't look terribly difficult. Uh, I've spent some time looking through them, and they were fairly fast to read. So this is a game where the goal is to escape from Rome. I don't know what you're supposed to represent, but to make your way through southern Italy and into Africa. And once you make it there, you win the game. Okay, well, how do you get there? It's a good question. Um, and why does that sound so hard? Well, part of why it sounds so hard is there's this goth. And he's going to be moving through northern Italy, destroying your farms and cities and such, not? Until finally he makes it to Rome and the game ends. Of course, the game would end if you make it to Africa. The game can also end a couple of other ways. For example, if all the building cards run out, or if uh, one player has to play a production card and doesn't have one. I'm not sure what the balance on those is. It seems to me that in different numbers of players, there will always be one specific time limit, either the building cards, uh, which is a rather large deck in six players, and I'm of course playing six players. Uh, <coughs> it, I, I don't think that can run out in six players. I think the production might be more likely because that's more or less actually a smaller number than, say, in five players. There's more cards total. There's a couple of cards that are taken out of the deck in the six-player game. Or uh, the goth himself moving. Of course, victory through moving to, to Africa is somewhat dependent on how the players act. So is the Goths movement, but I don't know by how much. So, uh, at the beginning of the game, there should be some counters on people that I have not done. Everybody gets a food, a gold, and a piece. Okay, so green is food, gold is gold, and white is peace. And everybody will be starting with this set and it's behind a screen. Now these little screens are like in Dune. Little things you can fold and set up. I'm just going to hold them like this because I don't really feel like dealing with the complexity with my table and uh, walking space right now. All right. Uh, so everybody has that as their starting position. They also have a set of cards that's exactly the same. Uh, and that depends on the number of players. But it's basically a set of farms, cities, and peace producing, I guess, soldiers or something. I don't want to use the word soldiers because this is a German game. Uh, okay. Peace is our profession. Do you start with any cards face up? Looks like you do. Place any remaining... I don't know. Each player puts... It, okay. So each player is going to get to choose a production card that they put face up. All right. On your turns, and I'm going to work counterclockwise from the left upper corner, who's, I guess, the green player. we got these weird little plastic glassy type tokens, which are kind of funky compared to what most of us are used to, I guess. This is a great idea, by the way, putting a, a pool of chip of things into a little cup. I didn't come up with it. Whoever I bought it from did that. Uh, they have to draw a card from here, and that's going to go face up. And we'll see how that works in a moment. But those are the building cards which go on top of your production area cards and give you additional options. They have to do that every turn. And it actually goes in the plus five space. And if there's anything already down, it slides down. 
If it slides off the track, it goes into the discard space. Um, then they must play a production card. And remember, they're going to have one of these face up. They get to play another one. Now that, when they play that card, that type of card produces. And that means if you just, say, play to farm and you have a farm, then everyone, if you just play to farm, then everyone who has farms gets to produce from them. Now, if they have no buildings on them, they produce a green token. If they have a building, they have a choice between producing what is actually normally produced there and taking the building's special uh, advantage for production. Um, and the building's special advantages are listed on them uh, as to what, what you can do. So, for example, this one, if you pay a food, you get... Oh, no, if you, if you activate it here, you get a food and a step. Those little bullseyes are steps, and those are movement towards Africa, which is, of course, what you need to win. Uh, this one has a production ability which says you can turn something in and get other things as your action. Um, red cards are a little special. They can be activated at any time, I believe. Uh, but for example, this one's a builder card. It can only be activated to build a building, which we'll get to in a bit. Goth wall card can only be activated to affect a goth, uh, the goths movement. Okay, good enough. So, after I play uh, my production card, everybody gets to activate their cards, and they actually must. Then I have the option to purchase one of the building cards. Now, I just pay the cost of the building card, which is along the upper right here, to get it. But I have to have the proper production area to put it on that's empty. When I do that, I get a little bonus right away. Um, oh, yeah, the cost here is an additional cost to the cost marked on the card. These can be any type of resources. So it's cheapest to build something that's been out for a while. It'll cost you a lot to build the newest building. Um, but I think you get your bonus at this point. Yeah, when you build a, a card, a building, there's a little uh, circle or wreath with some steps on it. And you get that many steps for building that building. So that's kind of a bonus for you right there. I don't think you can build buildings right away on the first turn. Uh, we'll see how expensive they are and what, what they cost, but that five extra token cost, that's going to be huge, right? Okay, so now the, uh, fifth action is to pay uh, tribute for the goth. The goth is going to move one space each turn. And remember, when he reaches Rome, the game's over. And everybody doesn't lose. The person who's furthest along wins, but somehow it feels like you're losing, I think. Okay. When he lands on a space, well, when he passes over a space, and if there's only one that he's moving to, he will destroy, if he's only going one space, he'll destroy a production card of that type. And that production card goes into the death pile, whatever. Okay, that sounds bad. It's my turn. I'm going to lose one of my production cards. I just got to play one. What the hell? Well, there's an option. You can pay him the correct type of production. So if he's moving into a farm, you can pay him a green. Give him a food. And you mark that by putting it on the board. And you tell him, we'll feed you, just don't bother us. And he doesn't. And then the next person gets to go. And when it's his turn for the goth to move, well, he's got to give a gold up. And if he does that, the goth still doesn't move. Okay, so the goth never moves, right? Well, maybe, maybe not. A player can choose not to pay the goth, 
And if there's already multiple places up there, the goth moves all of them. Now notice, he's lost a movement no matter what here, right? Uh, if I'm the first person and I pay the goth off, and then the second person doesn't, the goth only moves one space. He moves to the last space with, uh, with tribute on it. Then, each space he moved over, he's going to destroy a property for. But the person who's active, and then going clockwise from him, have to pay the price. And they have to pay it one at a time. So, in this, first, in this second case here where we have uh, two tribute, if the third person doesn't want to give, okay, now the third person has his option of whether to destroy a farm or a city. And whichever one he takes, the next person, someone who didn't pay tribute yet, loses the next piece. Is that the correct order? Yeah. So, when you pay tribute, you're kind of sacrificing a later player in exchange for your own loss. Uh, but, eventually, there could be a number of tribute spaces equaling the number of players. And at that point, you may, and the rules suggest this, you may want to trigger goth movement anyhow and not pay tribute because you're at a point where you're going to lose a territory on the next play anyway, uh, on the next goth move anyway. You're not going to be able to put it off any further, although you may lose less than someone else. And at this moment, you at least get the first choice of what you get to lose. And they kind of alternate so you can lose something that's less important to you. After all the territories have been lost, the tribute that was paid to Goth is then collected in the same manner. So starting with the active player and going clockwise, but in my case counterclockwise because I'm you know, crazy that way, uh, the players get to pick one resource back. So there's a lot of advantages when all things are equal to getting that first choice. So I'm not sure. It may be that we will constantly see the goth moving six spaces at a time. It may not be, though, because someone may want to buy something and use up all their tribute and take a loss for it and, and take it right away, in which case you could see the balance of power shifting to the people who paid tribute as opposed to the people who didn't. Just a thought there. All right, and that is what happens on a given turn. Um, see a little bit more detail as we play, but I think I've given a brief overview of what the rules themselves are. I don't know uh, how much I'm going to like this or dislike it. It looks interesting still, which some games do not after a first look. Uh, so, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs>